Hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Welcome to our session, Archiving um, Exhibitions in the Digital Age, What is Forever? Um, I'm Christine Kwan. I'm the Chief Content Officer and VP of External Affairs at ArtStore. And nobody knows what that means. Um, I don't really know what it means. It means I work on collections, image collections for ArtStore Digital Library, as well as the communications and the relationships with museums and libraries and archives. And so today we have a really fantastic panel, um, wonderful experts and professionals in archiving and museums, collections management and information management. Um, we are going to hear from three speakers today. Um, the first speaker is going to be Jonathan Lill, project archivist at MoMA Archives. And then um, Deborah White, head of digital collections and services at Brooklyn Museum. And uh, finally, we're going to hear from Hirja Jacobs from the Rijksmuseum, all the way from the Netherlands, and she's got a superb presentation. And we had a last minute change. Um, Nick Honeyset from the Getty was going to talk about the online scholarly catalog initiative, and he asked Roger Howard to sub for him, and Roger's come down with a cold, so he can't be with us this morning. So I'm very sorry about that. But um, a lot of us here in the room work on publications, and I think we can also talk about the future of the exhibition catalog and um, permanent collection catalogs. And um, so I think there's enough expertise in the room to still cover that subject. Um, I just wanted to do a quick overview of some of the issues that um, I was thinking about when we put together this panel. And I thought I'd start with um, this photograph. This is. Uh, my grandparents and my father in the middle. Um, it's an old disintegrating photograph that I have. It's taken in 1957. Um, what, what my grandfather is primarily known for is he was a military general for the Nationalist Party in Taiwan. Um, and he was also a painter. And he was also a fine arts professor. And he exhibited throughout China and Taiwan. And there is no extant documentation of those exhibitions. Um, what I think is kind of interesting about that is obviously that's a personal history um, that's interesting to me, but I think um, in light of the historical changes that were going on in Asia um, around the 1940s and 50s, those <coughs> exhibitions would have been very interesting to historians and art historians studying um, modern art from China or from Asia now. Um, Obviously, exhibitions are important to art historians who are doing research and who are studying and tracing the development of the history of art. This is the uh, Magicien de la Terre exhibition in Paris in 1989 at the Pompidou, which um, was an exhibition that is widely credited for sort of the first um, emergence of Chinese contemporary artists on the international world stage. Um, and then, of course, we all know that exhibitions are not just important to history of art, but it's important to the history of, of the world and all of our, um, a lot of disciplines beyond uh, art history and fine art. And this is the Degenerate Art uh, Nazi exhibition organized um, and exhibited in Munich in 1937. And then I just wanted to talk a bit about art stores' interest in this subject. Um, we obviously work with a lot of museums to share permanent collection objects and data. Um, and we have been promoting museums on our homepage and social media for over eight years. Mm -hmm. And it is purely for educational and scholarly teaching use and research use. Um, we currently share the exhibition uh, installation archives from MoMA, over 16,000 images. It includes the um, event photography, this is um, Edward Hopper and his wife um, in, a, in an exhibition opening, and um, early installations of Duchamp and, and other really important artists in the history of modern art. And um, it's just been a hugely popular installation archive collection in Art Store alongside um, MoMA's permanent collections. Um, we also share documentation of New York gallery exhibitions. This is Larry Qualls on the left, um, who has shot New York gallery scenes for over three decades, and he continues to shoot um, every week. 
And it really traces the development of contemporary art in New York City and what was shown and when it was shown and which galleries were showing it. So for researchers and for curators, it's a highly um, useful collection. Um, and then we also work with the New Museum Installation Archives, which documents everything from installations to performance and things like that. And we're also working with the Metropolitan and a bunch of other museums um, who now are very interested in also sharing their exhibition documentation as well as their permanent collections. So all that being said, museums are spending a huge amount of money and a huge amount of resources putting together special exhibitions. This is um, a show at the American <coughs> Museum of Natural History that I went to, and it was just this total multi-sensory experience with dioramas, interactive touch screens, videos, audio, um, companion websites, and all this other stuff. And I think one of, the, one, one of the questions that all of us are asking now is what do future generations have access to? Which pieces of these exhibitions will be preserved and accessible for future research? Um, and this I just wanted to mention just because I, I live in New York and um, the Alexander McQueen <coughs> show was a huge sensation. It had, um, is anyone here from the Met? Billy? How many visitors did it have? like over 600,000 visitors yeah. to this one show. They had to extend the hours. They had to um, keep the galleries open till midnight or something ridiculous like that. But um, I went to the show pretty late and I'm a shopper and I went to the gift shop and I'm like, okay, there's only pencils here. <laughs> What's going on? Why are there only pencils at the McQueen show? And um, I think from a you know, costume scholarship standpoint, this was an important exhibition, but also from a commercial standpoint and also I think museum directors might be looking at this exhibition in the future in terms of sort of the business planning behind this exhibition. And I think from a merchandising standpoint, I know a lot of museums now are really looking at revenue. You know, what sort of documentation is there about the entirety of the exhibition, the design concepts, the, um, I mean, every room was sort of a different uh, experience, um, as well as sort of the business planning behind these exhibitions. And, and I think um, in the future to museum studies and other disciplines, this kind of information could be extremely helpful to people working within museums. Um, and then of course, um, exhibitions reintroduce media to the public um, that may have been forgotten. This is Tom Campbell's um, show, at Tapestry in the Renaissance, which effectively made people aware of a forgotten medium, uh, the tapestry. And, um, and of course, what we have left behind or what's publicly accessible is generally the exhibition catalog. And, you know, what does this really mean for future generations? Most of these catalogs can't be digitized. There are rights issues. Um, most museums probably only have enough time to work out clearance for permissions to use the images in print. So what does that mean for um, future scholars? And then finally, I, I just wanted to open this question of the fact that um, there is a widespread belief that everything's online and especially um, people think that what museums put out today in terms of exhibitions is going to be available online in some format. I went to, um, and I'm sorry, all these examples, most of these examples are from New York because I live in New York, but I went to this show. It was a fantastic show by Song Dong. It's called Waste Not, and it exhibits all of the things, which are basically trash, but bits of things that his mother collected through decades of living through mainland China um, through this history. And I walked out of the exhibition and there was a catalog and it was a story, it was a book of stories of why his mother had saved all of these objects. And I bought it and it was great. And a few months later I was telling a friend about the show and I was like, oh, let me get you the catalog. I'll buy you the catalog. And I went back to the MoMA website. The catalog's not listed. I Googled it, I couldn't find it anywhere. I went to Amazon, I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, then I just flipped over the back of the catalog and I searched the ISBN number. I found out it's, it was printed in Tokyo and it's out of print. And so I think we're already up against a situation where a lot of 
scholars studying uh, the history of art or contemporary art have an assumption that the materials are already digitized and it's available online. And then um, there's this difficulty of um, searching for things that actually haven't been digitized because a lot of libraries may not have gotten a copy of this catalog. It wasn't the official catalog. It was just a little book that was produced. And so with all of these um, really big, broad questions in mind, I would like to welcome John Lil. So come on up. Thank you, Christine. Um, touching on some of her comments, I don't direct, directly address this in my talk, but I think it's good to keep in mind, and I often think about this for, as an archivist, uh, the idea of acceptable loss or acceptable attrition in uh, records, because it seems to me that we get caught up in keeping things now because it, in some ways, seems so much easier to keep things. And yet if we look at the span of our historical records, then there are tremendous gaps. And I think if we accept that as part of the natural flow of history or of record generation and record storage, then it might make us more comfortable with the idea of losing things today. For instance, although the catalog Christine was talking about isn't technically a MoMA publication, it is also true that MoMA has no list of all the things we've ever published so that we don't know whether we can put our hands on everything. Now, certainly we can put our hands on most things, we hope, but we don't know. Anyway, when we speak of exhibition documentation, it seems to me we are usually speaking of three distinct types of materials. Uh, firstly, are materials published or produced directly for the public to provide information on the exhibition. This category includes press releases, checklists, postcards, brochures, and catalogs. Um, also in the press office, we, uh, they collect press clippings and other public materials that were published elsewhere. The second category comprises the self-conscious recording of the actual exhibition by the museum, primarily through installation photography, though occasionally by other means. And the third category includes the curatorial, registrarial, and other internal departmental records created during the development of the exhibition. These materials classically include correspondence, loan records, background research, as well as a wide array of other materials, and they provide crucial evidence as to how exhibitions are conceived and developed. In recent years, the Museum of Modern Art Archives and Library have made advances in making materials from each of these three categories available to the public. In my talk, I'm going to survey these recent changes at MoMA, and then I'll review my current efforts to organize and make available to the public the extensive exhibition documentation of MoMA PS1. Finally, if I have time, I'll look at some of the changes in exhibition documentation we see occurring today and discuss how the archives expects to face the challenges these changes present. Concerning the first category of materials, press releases are a major resource for researchers, and it's easy to underestimate how many inquiries, how much time the archives takes uh, just answering the requests for these materials. A significant amount of reference requests the archives handles is only for the substantiation of exhibition details such as title, dates, artists included. While press releases are found throughout curatorial records and other archival collections, the museum library has always maintained a separate set of these releases in binders as part of their special collection. Because demand for these materials was so high, it justified the cost of digitization, and in 2009, the MoMA Library completed the project to digitize all of the press releases. Now these thousands of documents are on the MoMA website and are full text searchable. Um, the MoMA, uh, a, simple, a very simple web interface was built for navigating, and no separate search engine is used apart from the basic MoMA website search engine. The second category of documentation, the intentional self-documentation of exhibitions, is composed largely of installation photographs. The museum took photographs of exhibitions from the moment it opened in 1929. And there's a shot of the first exhibition. Today, we have surpassed 26,000 installation images. It's good to keep in mind, too, that that number doesn't include prints edited out of the official set of images, as well as duplicates and stray photographs, all of which are still being identified <coughs> elsewhere in the archive. 
Yet for all of the museum's apparent assiduousness in producing and organizing these images, there are today at least 662 exhibitions we know existed that have no installation images at all. Nearly a quarter of the museum's total exhibitions up to today. Now, admittedly, that number includes rotations of the permanent collection and other activities that at the time may not have been considered exhibitions, but certainly we consider them exhibitions now. And many of these things indeed did have uh, exhibition names, exhibition numbers, signifying that the museum did consider them exhibitions, but for some reason didn't document them. Even as late as 2001 or later, uh, there are very significant exhibitions, however small they were significant, that do not have photography of them. Um, However, today, and in the last five years, we can feel much more confident that we are capturing almost everything, if not absolutely everything. And that, again, gets to the idea of what an acceptable loss or an acceptable lack of documentation might be. Beginning in 2002, individual installation images and other scanned documents from the archives that had been scanned by specific request were viewable through a local web interface in a system we call MAID. And I'll show you a couple of the MAID search pages. It's important to note this is not a dam. It's not for the management of the actual digital assets. It's... MADE is much more a system for uh, creating and managing the metadata and providing a user interface for the search and retrieval of these images. In, uh, let's see. In 2006, ArtStore approached the museum offering to scan all of our installation prints, our physical prints, an offer we eagerly accepted. It took more than two years for ArtStore to scan and catalog nearly 19,000 installation prints, and today most of those are viewable at the museum via MADE and around the world through the ArtStore website that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Beginning next year, and this has been on the horizon for a while and we seem finally to coming to grips with it, we are exploring placing all of our installation photography online on the MoMA website. Eventually then, all of our images will be accessible to all but unfortunately it's too early to even know what any of the details of that will be, what it will look like, how it will be integrated with the rest of the MoMA website content or whether it will be segregated with archival content in some way. Finally, the third category of exhibition documentation is curatorial and other departmental records. Before the MoMA uh, museum archives were established in 1989, These records were largely unavailable to the public and were mainly stored in curatorial offices or wherever space could be found. But even once the archives existed, it took years for those records to be brought together into our custody. Not until 2000 were exhibition files officially handed over, and even then we weren't able to store them on site and conveniently serve them up to staff and the public until around 2006. Only once we had them in hand could we begin inventorying them and vetting them to know what we had thus producing this document, our exhibition documentation chart. This list is being continuously updated, not only to add new document uh, exhibitions, but because documentation for older exhibitions is still being discovered in odd and out-of-the-way places. You can see that here we list whether any registrar files exist for an exhibition, any curatorial files, whether these files have been vetted, and if so, how many the public might be allowed to see. We also note whether there are official installation photos in the photo archive, whether those images have been scanned, whether images or documentation on these shows exist in other major archival collections. And even though we started work on this list in 2004, after seven years, it was only this year that we felt it was complete and accurate enough, accurate enough finally to place online, albeit in a simplified way so that the public isn't as confused as we are by it. Um, <laughs> And this is, just for us, it's been a tremendous accomplishment. It looks just like a simple chart, a flat table, but it is the culmination of years of work by numerous staff, and it actually represents approximately 15,000 files of exhibition records. Now I'll move on to discuss a little bit of my work at PS1. The organization we now know as MoMA PS1 was founded in 1971 by Alana Heiss, initially to provide studio space to artists by taking over derelict commercial space. But exhibitions followed soon after, I guess because when you bring 
enough artists together, they automatically want to put on a show. Um, they occupied three or four different spaces as studio and exhibition sites before moving into their Long Island City School building in 1976, a building that was indeed Public School One in Queens. And they are still there, of course. In that enormous space, and also at a subsidiary space, the Clock Tower Gallery in Lower Manhattan, PS1 has staged over 1,000 exhibitions, performances, concerts, and other events in what is now a 40-year history. In 1999, they signed an agreement with MoMA to begin a 10-year merger process. When that process concluded at the end of 2009, the archives assumed responsibility for the PS1 records, and I was hired to organize and describe the records so that they could be finally open to the public. They had been available only sporadically and to only to the very persistent researcher. I went into this project expecting to find the same array of exhibition documentation that MoMA has produced and kept and in this I was not disappointed. That is to say that the materials I found match more or less the three categories I mentioned at the beginning. Press releases, and here's a press release for the very first exhibition in that school building room, which has attained a somewhat legendary status within the New York art world. Um, installation photography, and here are two shots, one by Charles Simmons, and that's actually a permanent installation by Richard Serra, which is still in the building, but not open for public viewing, or has it really quite been maintained. Um, and then curatorial and departmental records about the exhibition. But where MoMA has had years to establish a reliable exhibition history list, an exhibition documentation chart, as I showed you, and other tools, I am creating these materials from the ground up as I organize the records file by file. To help, as I describe the materials in what will be the guide to the collection or the finding aid, I have also been creating a cross-index to the records so that these most popular types of exhibition documentation can be easily located by researchers and by staff. The records of PS1 are still about a year away from being completed, completely organized and open to the public, so none of these materials are complete. And this is just a kind of mock-up of what it will look like eventually. Similar in some respects to Moma's exhibition documentation chart, here you can see whether for any particular show we have press releases, checklists, printed ephemera, loan records, or just general curatorial files. And you can see for the exhibition room, this is only a, a section of the documentation I have found, but we have numerous files of installation photographs, though probably not of the artwork you actually want. Um, we have clippings and reviews, a good amount of printed ephemera, one checklist at least, or something that approaches a real checklist, and a couple of different press releases, one of which I have scanned. And uh, this was produced by an access database that I'm doing most of my description in, though it's actual, how it will be presented to the public is still a little up in the air. It might be simply a behind the, the scenes tool for our reference staff to use when uh, handling research requests. But because I've built it in access, it is this cross-index that allows us right now, uh, even though the project's not done, to understand the true extent of PS1's <coughs> exhibition documentation. For instance, uh, of the 1,019 exhibitions and events that occurred before 2005, we have press releases for approximately 562 shows. We have checklists for 200 shows, though it's important to note that many exhibitions that were actually performance programs, movie screenings, and other things for which checklists wouldn't have been produced. We have news clippings for 450 exhibitions, postcards or other printed ephemera for 446, installation photographs for 500, and curatorial and other departmental records pertaining to about 613 exhibitions. In total, we have some kind of documentation for 918 shows, 90%. Considering the poor storage and organization con uh, conditions for these records over the course of 40 years, the extent of the documentation is both impressive and reassuring. But of course, there's always going to be someone asking about the show that we have nothing for. So, By the time the records of PS1 are open to the public, we expect the collection to comprise nearly 15,000 folders and stretch over 300 linear feet. 6,000 of those folders will be direct exhibition documentation. The others are administrative, education, um, building records, and, and so forth. 
What I have discussed today is the most recent efforts by the museum archives to organize the primary exhibition documentation of MoMA and PS1 and make it available to the staff and public. Meanwhile, the rest of the museum races ahead, generating every more co ever more content, most of which is now digital. Each of the three categories of exhibition documentation I've been discussing is facing changes and challenges, primarily caused by technology. In the first category, public materials, the museum is expanding the range of materials produced for the public by placing more and more digital content on the web and by producing both special exhibition and general collection apps for mobile devices. If, say, brochures begin being produced solely as mobile content, then how will the archives or the museum guarantee their preservation? If apps merely repackage content also found elsewhere, should we worry about the long-term preservation of the specific format or simply focus our efforts on keeping the content in whatever shape or form? If it, are there particular experiences that, are, that we figure are going to be so important that they need to be preserved in some way? such as if people read a QR code on wall labels. In 20 years, will a researcher want to reconstruct that specific experience of scanning the code and seeing the content pop up on whatever mobile device they're using in 20 years? In 50 years, will anyone ask after exhi exhibition-related blog content, and will, we, oh, excuse me, and will we be able to present it to them in... Well, that was the last slide anyway, so I'll keep going. <laughs> um, with installation photography, MoMA is increasing the amount of performance at the museum, both as parts of larger exhibitions and as standalone events, so there is concern that still photography won't adequately capture enough information. We are moving steadily forward, ensuring that those performances that we think require it will be filmed. But as with still photography, I can only presume our efforts to capture activities through other media will be imperfect and there will be gaps. But we should also ask ourselves first whether it will always be needed. The archives has not yet felt extensive interest or pressure from researchers for direct video documentation of exhibitions, however easy it is to imagine that situation changing in the coming decades. And with curatorial and registrarial records, we have yet to solve the now familiar issues of the preservation of electronic documents of all formats. With paper curatorial records, researchers almost always go directly to the folder marked correspondence. But pres preserving staff email so that the public can someday have access to it is not an issue we will have solved for many years. Organizing and providing public access to text, spreadsheet, and other types of electronic documents within archival record collections is a problem facing archives, archivists everywhere, and is an issue the profession is only now grappling with to the extent of formulating best practices, standardizing software tools, and recommending workflows. MoMA is far from alone in being far from a solution. Catching up with the documentation the museum has been producing for more than 80 years, and that PS1 has produced for 40 years, has required enormous amounts of time and money and is a never-ending process. The organization and arrangement of these materials and making them accessible to museums, staff, and the public has taken years of work and the generosity of outside organizations like ArtStore. It is a large enough project simply to maintain these activities without worrying also of how the museum is leaping ahead in producing new media and new forms of documentation. Even as these new avenues are explored, we shouldn't presume that the older forms and simpler things, the plain press release, the checklist, the still photo, are auto automatically outmoded and we should be comfortable with the gaps. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And now we're gonna hear from Deborah White. Good morning. So, using a little bit of my handheld. If any of you ever need a timer, there's this very cool little app called Zen Timer. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's a uh, stopwatch, but it uses Zen bells instead of buzzers. So it's one of my favorite things. Um, I'm, uh, you're going to hear some parallels between my talk and Jonathan's, um, but I'm going to sort of be looking more at this movement towards digital, towards born digital materials. Um, 
and I have for you um, some uh, some URLs in case you have a good enough signal in here if you want to go into our website and poke around while I'm showing some examples. Um, here are the URLs and here are our um, tags for, for Twitter people. Um, so I started out as an archivist. Um, I was hired by the Brooklyn Museum in 1986 to organize the archives. Um, many of the things that I did over the years um, were very similar to what happened at MoMA. Um, now, however, uh, in 2005, I was asked to organize um, a centralized digital imaging, um, digital collections department for the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and so I sort of moved from doing some digital projects in archives to being responsible for digital projects um, museum-wide. So my position now is kind of a middle ground between the archives and technology. I still... Um, have my connections in archives and, and my deep interest in archives, but I'm also involved in producing born digital materials. So um, um, what I'm going to show you today are some of the things that we're doing. Um, I should say in 1986 when I started in the archives, um, there was no network. Um, there was no website. I had one standalone computer with a 20 megabyte hard drive. So, um, but we we did start creating um, databases right from the beginning, and that was critical. So, oops, sorry. So this is um, sort of a this is our standard finding aid for exhibition records at the Brooklyn Museum. It's a little more intense than some museums do or other archives because we always felt that um, we wanted to provide more information about each folder because we did so much of the, um, of the reference work. So we wanted to be able to search on words. So it gives us a really good handle on what's in the archives. So I took that finding aid and playing with Wordle, um, I made a tag cloud from it. Um, and as you can see, huge amount of the content is correspondence. So I wiped that out. Um, because I wanted to see the other things. Um, so these are the kind of things that are appearing in our archives. From there, um, I made a list of my favorite things, most important things, and, and you'll see many of the things on that screen, which is my not so pretty tag cloud, um, are the same ones that Jonathan was talking about. Um, and I grouped them into internal and external. Now, the next one is, um, what's born digital now? And the bright green stuff is now born digital. So of the things that we had before that we were creating, almost all of it is born digital. And some of the things that are, so, that are in white um, are actually, they're moving into digital. So brochures, there are, there are print brochures, but there's also web um, materials. Um, some of the things are both, um, the green and blue are both analog and digital at this point. And of course, email has become a huge issue. So correspondence and memos are probably largely email at this point. Um, and the ones in italics are things that have morphed into something different. So co comment books, those books we used to put in the galleries and people would scribble in, have now become online um, comments. Um, the email I've mentioned has morphed as well. So going back in time, oops, sorry, there we go. This was um, my first HTML project and it's sort of like what Jonathan was showing you. This was our exhibition um, index. And I created this for our own website, or our own intranet, so that people could actually find information about our exhibitions. We started hanging this off of the library catalog when we started digitizing our installation views. And so now we had this spreadsheet that was converted into, or database that was converted into um, an HTML page with some hot links to the actual images. And we were cataloging the images and hanging off them off the library catalog. Um, and I should, uh, 
uh, thank the Art Institute of Chicago for sort of this format because um, Bart Rickbosch was the first person that actually I think had done something similar of creating an exhibition index. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, so now we're going to go back to now. Um, this is essentially what the brochure has turned into. It's the, it's the splash page, the exhibition page on our website. Um, and there are actually two places on our website that we're going to look at exhibitions. This is the exhibitions tab, but we're also going to look at the collections tab, which is sort of, it's sort of where the archives are now. Although this exhibition is also under collections as well, but it's where things are being preserved. Um, so we have, we have the promo in many forms now, just not, not just paper. Um, we have media on the website. Um, and the media, interestingly enough, um, we're putting other places as well. So um, we put images, sort of back, behind the scenes images about exhibitions on Flickr, on our Brooklyn Museum Flickr channel, um, and we link them over to our website making a slideshow. One of the things that we consider really important is go where the people go. So yes, people are going to come to the Brooklyn Museum website to look for our exhibitions or our hours or how to get there, but there are people trolling around Flickr who are just interested in images. And so we capture those people there and then possibly bring them to our website or possibly just that's where they look at our stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then we also, obviously, we use YouTube to, um, to mount our videos. We have a YouTube channel and bring those over to the website as well. The comment books um, have almost completely gone digital. Um, there is a talk tab on our website in this area, and there's also a talk tab in our collections area. Um, people are commenting on our exhibitions constantly. What's really interesting to me is it seems to be a current right now thing. So people comment a lot on the exhibition page in this area, there's much less in the way of commenting and, ta and tagging on the historical exhibitions. Um, either people are coming to that area just for research or um, I'm not sure why, honestly. Um, tagging is very, very prevalent on our collections pages for objects. Once we put up a picture of an object, it's tagged heavily within a couple of days. The exhibitions and the archives materials are not, and I'm, I honestly don't quite understand you know, what that is, unless there are people that just love works of art, and they go looking for them, and they tag them. So that's, that's my guess at what's going on there. Um, oh, print is still around. Um, but it has kind of morphed. So we have a, a print tab. Um, it's where our teacher packets go. Those are PDFs. So that's just sort of an easy morph from digital to from analog to digital. Um, that's where e-commerce for catalogs is. Um, I'm going to take a little detour on catalogs because one of the thing about catalogs is Tons of them, we discovered, have been digitized already by Google Books. And um, we were about to start a big catalog digitization project or a pilot project. And we thought, you know, we had a list of ones that we were going to do. And suddenly Hathi Trust, which is hosted at University of Michigan, came to my attention. And of the 10 or 11 books that we were going to send out and have digitized, nine of them were already digitized and available on Hathi Trust, but not as full text. So they had the record and they said, it's there, but you can't see it. So um, what we did was we worked with Hathi Trust. They have Creative Commons licenses. And we decided to release all of our catalogs um, that they had the digital versions of before 1980. Um, we're not worrying about permissions on the internal 
images until somebody comes to us and says, oh, you know, you just released our, the catalog from 1940 and it's got an image that we licensed to you and we didn't give you digital rights. Um, honestly, I don't think other museums are likely to do that. So um, if you go to Hathi Trust, you can find, um, I think it's about 250 of our catalogs um, available for full text. Um, so here's the exhibition index in the 2011 context. Um, it's a lot prettier, um, it's certainly more functional, um, and it's right within the collections area of the Brooklyn Museum. If you go looking for an object, you're going to find an exhibitions tab, and you can come right to the page um, and look at our exhibitions going back to the 1840s. Um, we, don't, we don't segregate the archives off. Archives is within collections in general. Um, we treat long-term installations, as MoMA does, as the same as um, special exhibitions. Um, this is one um, that just opened our African Innovations show. Um, as you can see, you've got a good image and then a series of them under underneath. Most of these now are born digital. Um, everything that's born digital um, goes directly into our dams and from the dams it goes here. There's no hand coding on these pages. Um, we load an image and the next day it's up on the website um, with the metadata. Um, our historic ones are in there as well. We digitized um, about, let's see, we have, about, we have more than 4,000 born digital images and more than 6,000 um, scanned from our historical records. Um, the scanning project was um, funded by our Mellon Archives Initiative project grant, so I should thank them for that. Um, we did print slides and negatives. We did not do events, um, but we did do sort of um, process images. This is the building of the David Mock um, hair's breadth, which was magazines that were spiraled around the <coughs> columns in our, in our main lobby. Um, as I mentioned, our, all of our images and data are ser uh, served from our Luna dams. Um, However, we use uh, the look and feel of the website is not Luna. Luna does allow you to, to port just straight Luna to the website, but we wanted a Brooklyn Museum look and feel, so that's um, programmed on the back end. Um, and it also allows us to include data and images from other, or data from other sources. So um, our website, the collections part, is driven by Luna, by TMS and um, other materials are in a homegrown content management um, system. Um, did I miss the press releases? Uh-oh, wait a minute, let me go back. Tell me I didn't put a slide in for this. I could have sworn I put those in. Maybe I haven't gotten to them yet. <laughs> Oh yeah, they're coming up, sorry. <laughs> this is what happens when you speak from notes instead of from um, a script. Um, so so when, you, when you're on, on an exhibition page, there's a link to TMS for the objects um, when we have those recorded in TMS. One of the real challenges we've faced is that um, we have a checklist database that we made for exhibitions. So um, over a period of about 10 years, one of our volunteers took every catalog, entered artist and title into a database that links it to the exhibition information. The problem is the catalogs, the checklists, you know, the rough list that we pulled out of our archives, the names and titles are not vetted. They're not uh, authorized. So you have funny spellings of artists. Um, titles that may not match. So there was a feeling that we w didn't want to release that immediately, but our TMS staff are gradually getting the information about museum objects, at least, that were in exhibitions into TMS, and from there it can be ported to the exhibitions page and linked back to the object pages so that you can click through and um, and see the, uh, the actual object record with all the data, and it sort of goes deeper. So um, if the object has some audio, that's there. So you've got the exhibition with the exhibition audio, and you've got the individual objects with sort of rich, rich content on those as well. Um, you'll see that there are lots of tags for, um, for this object. 
Um, we did a big project ca to capture didactics, um, which was huge. Um, when I was in archives, we had always wanted to get the didactic and caption information for exhibitions, and we always ran up against a wall because the curators in their records would have their first draft or last draft, but then it went to editorial who worked on it, and editorial passed it off to design who put it in InMagic, and you couldn't capture the final version back from InMagic because it was InMagic, it, wouldn't, um, it was not easy to get. So um, our technology staff um, finally worked out a deal with um, design so that things automatically come to technology from design and get um, put into the content management system from where they go to the website. For things that were on view um, at the time we started this and we couldn't get the stuff from design, they actually sent um, an intern out into the galleries with um, a point and shoot camera, shot all the didactics, converted them um, uh, using OCR software and then pulled them in. So it was sort of a um, scrappy-do, typical Brooklyn Museum way, figure out a way to do it and get it done. Um, and so now we, now we routinely have the didactics on our website. Um, we also captured press releases. Um, we capture them now because they're born digital. There's a press, press area of the museum. Um, and so they just automatically come into the exhibition area from that area. There was, there's no sense in you know, waiting until they're in archives and then bringing them in. For all the back press um, releases like Momo, we did a scanning project, um, OCR'd them, and they're now um, with the exhibitions. We've scanned all our press releases, but we've only OCR'd the exhibitions ones at this point. We'll get to the rest at some point. Um, so you can see the, the original and you can um, also search text. Um, and it really, if you use the keyword search for an artist, for example, even though we don't have all the artists um, named for our exhibitions, if they're mentioned in the press release, you're going to find them. And just in closing then, um, we have an exhibition up now called uh, Li Ming Wei, The Moving Garden, um, where it's a huge um, granite sort of tabletop with a channel down the middle that kind of wanders and in the channel are these vases of flowers and the idea is you take a flower um, you leave the museum and you give it to a stranger um, so um, here's here are my conclusions as my flowers to you um, uh, it's when it's born digital capture it get it into your system um, don't wait till down the road. So find a way to capture it right away, as we're doing with the press releases and the didactics right now. And the exhibition installation views. They're just, they're digital and they just go into the system. Um, convert when you can. Um, we all have a lot of analog materials out there. Um, in terms of storage and serving the Im images and the materials, databases is the way to go. There's, there's you know, coding special web pages um, means that your stuff is going to get lost. If it's in a database, if your museum website design changes, the database is still there, um, even if they decide not to put your content on the website. Um, I have this sort of sense that archives and active records are now coming together. Um, it, if it's digital, it's, it doesn't go through another program now. It's, it's there and it's permanent. Um, I'm a big believer that archival materials should not be segregated um, if you can help it. Um, I think that people, most people don't understand what archives are and they don't understand, you know, if you tell them go to the archives tab and search there, some people get it. And the deep, you know, the scholarly researchers do get it, and they they're going to do that. But what we want to do is capture more people um, by putting it out there with our collections. Um, and I'm a huge believer that that it that this partnership between um, technology archives and um, the digital people um, is that's what we have to do. Um, we have to work together. And just 
I have to show you at least one piece of art in this in this um, presentation. This is just um, a lovely fat. <laughs> so thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was great. And our final speaker is um, Kirtia Jacobs from the Rijksmuseum. And so welcome, Kirtia. Let me just get my water glass. Just click on, um, sorry, from that one, yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Geertje from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. I'd first like to thank Jonathan and Deborah for their beautiful and interesting uh, talks about the archiving and collecting the um, exhibitions. If you expect another um, talk about new technology for our database to uh, capture the exhibitions. I have to disappoint you. We don't have a system like that. I would like to demonstrate today to you some of the choices we've made and uh, how we are capturing our, um, the products we produce when making exhibitions. Um, I would like to consider the question, can museums digitize and keep everything that they produ produce for posterity? In an ideal situation with unlimited funding and manpower, all institutions would record the exhibition, atmosphere and approach as well as possible. New technology can help us to reach this ideal, but how great is the need for digitization? The current economic climate in the Netherlands, Europe and the United States forces us to make choices regarding our digitization, pol digitization policy and the implementation of our digital strategy. Museums are forced to critically review plans and goals and question at every stage, who are we doing this for? Who will benefit from the implementation of these plans? In what way can digitization and implementation of new technology be the most beneficial to various target audiences? The Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam is undergoing a large scale reconstruction. The main building has been closed since 2004 and the masterpieces are on display in the Philips wing. Over the last few years, the limited exhibition space in this wing and the preparations for the new Rijksmuseum have meant that few major exhibitions have been held. This will change when the museum reopens in 2013. Over the last seven years, the focus has been on work behind the scenes. One of the priorities have been digitizing and cataloging the art objects in order to make the collection more accessible in the future. It's a time-consuming yet worldwide project, cataloging and digitizing over a million objects in the collection. We have made a number of pragmatic choices to develop a standard approach and workflow to the range of cataloging and digitization projects. While making decisions as regards content, the registration backlogs as well as our target audiences are taken into consideration. What are our flagship collections? What's unique, surprising and special about them? What would the public like to see? Standards and workflow have been put in place for registration and digitization, which are constantly updated. All new projects are executed according to the above guidelines and approach. Um, the following examples of our, pro of our projects I will show you today clearly demonstrates that we are up for a standardized approach to digitizing and cataloging the collection. It's only 15 minutes to my speak today, my talk today, and I would like to give you an idea of the bigger projects that are running now and how it's related to exhibitions and capturing uh, uh, the material we produce. The Rijksmuseum realized in 2005 that it had a problem with the images of its objects. <laughs> the quality of the images was not good enough. Every vendor had its own version of a particular painting and there were too many copies in circulation of a single one, even within the museum. So this is a, um, a sh a, a, a from Google. If you search for the, the, the uh, milkmaid or for me, you get this. But even within the museum, it looked a little bit like this. <laughs> there were so many <laughs> images circulating around. And the management decided it should take the initiative for digitization. We realized we had to catch up with new technology and had to look ahead to a new digital future with standardized, standardized photography. 
It decided not to outsource the photography, but take on the challenge itself with the help of two kind Americans of reorganizing the studio and the imaging department. Over the last five years, we created a standardized photography method, centralized the delivery of the images, and implemented a dam system. This dam is connected to our collection management system. All the, the moment, at the moment, we are implementing a new ordering system for external clients via our website. And as you see here, for every type of object, we made a manual of how we are going to uh, capture the, the, the object, so the position, the lightning, the, the angles. And um, it made also the publication of exhibition catalogs much more easier. There's now one standard way of doing it, though we make change from time to time according to the design of the exhibition. But this is how, in the ideal situation, how the whole collection uh, has to be photographed, is going to be photographed. Um, Another example of the photography, the, uh, this is a painting of Kira de Boog II, and um, before we scanned the ectochromes and thought, okay, then it's digital, and this is the new capture uh, from June 2009 of how all our images are uh, uh, at the moment in the collection. The paintings have all been done, and we did a very great job, and lots of things are now in the more standardized and uh, high resolution uh, files. Um, in conjunction with the launch of the object or launch of the innovations in the photo studio, progress has been made in the approach to cataloging the objects in the collection database. We have worked to apply international standards, set up a new implementation guidelines and have taken a project based approach to catalog the collection. The museum's largest cataloging and digitization project is the print room online. It started in 2007, and we catalog over 13,000 works on paper a year. This project is all about quantity and quality. We have to catalog a lot of, lot of prints, but we need to get the basics right. In order to reach such large numbers, we set up a production line and very clear guidelines for the photographers and the catalogers. Being well prepared turned out to be half the battle. The structured approach and clear task definition meant that in 2011 we were able to present over 100,000 prints, drawings and photographs in the online collection catalogue. And as you see here we work from the real object, so we, every object is, passed, uh, is, is going to uh, this production line, we catalogue them, afterwards make photographs and then it goes to the uh, website and we are about to launch um, uh, uh, our API um, on the website so we will present it all, all our objects will be free and uh, easy to download from the site via an a API and we don't want to be the objects only on our own <coughs> website but be out there everywhere and let other people work with it and do nice things with it. Um, the Accessorized project, project is another example of, the of a digitization project. This collection is an extensive but difficult to manage and difficult to photograph. What started simply as a cataloging project for an <coughs> exhibition also, re also resulted in a publication, a glossy and a virtual exhibition. It just goes to show that working on the collection management and new ways of photography and cataloging can lead to new ideas for exhibitions. The Accessorized project included an exhibition, publications, and several web specials. How has this 2008 exhibition now been archived? Are the exhibition, publication, and web special archived in one place? The answer is no. The information is fragmented across the organization. Information regarding, regarding the physical exhibition is archived in the exhibitions and education department. The printed publications are archived in the library. The various images are in the DAMP system and the virtual exhibition is still online. Is this a problem? I don't think so. Considering the information type and uses, museum employees interested in setup or approach of a specific exhibition can find their way through these systems and archives. And with a little preparation time, we can assist, can assist every researcher with an interest in exhibitions of the Rijksmuseum. It's important to consider the relevant new information about the objects that this exhibition brought to light. 
the new research data is recorded in our collection database and new documentation is added ensuring that no knowledge is lost. The new images are added to the DAM system and linked to our collection catalogue and published online. In this way, the new knowledge acquired by ourselves and others remains accessible. How to archive virtual exhibitions remains a challenge. The Accessorize project is still online. We are currently working on a new site with a new CMS system. The best approach to archiving virtual exhibitions and web specials is on the ag agenda. You really should try, uh, there's not much time now, but you should try the, the web exhibition. And it's still online because many people loved, loved it and it's, many people come to the site to see the exhibition. So we leave it there, but we have to figure out what we are going to do because the website is going to be, there are so many exhibitions get, uh, arriving on the site and we, we need to do something to get it a little bit more structured. So that's the plan. <laughs> Um, work is currently underway on the Rijksmuseum's greatest exhibition of all time, the new Rijksmuseum. The main building is undergoing the most comprehensive renovation in its history. Maintenance was overdue and there was little remaining of the original architectural features and gallery layout. With the opening in 2013, the Rijksmuseum will be handed back to the public. The objects have been reorganized. They are no longer displays according to the department, but rather by period, from the Middle Ages to the 21st century. The aim of the new layout is to impart on visitors an understanding of the context and beauty of the objects. So I give you a sneak preview <laughs> of what it will look like. So this is the main court. They were uh, closed and now they're uh, reopened with lots of light and two parallel courts. And this is where you enter, and you see the the gallery. That's where the um, the bikes go through. So that's a big. We have a big bike lane uh, gate going on in the Netherlands, because the or in the original setup, um, the bikes could go through the museum, and uh, everyone just used it as a, a normal uh, way. But now with the new museum. We, we are expecting so many more visitors and the museum really would like to have it closed because <laughs> we are a bit <laughs> afraid of all the visitors being hurt by, <laughs> by the bikes just passing by. So it's a big bike lane gate and that was one of the problems uh, we uh, had to deal with uh, and which caused also the delay because you have a very strong bike uh, community in the Netherlands who is not agreeing. So some <laughs> some <laughs> details of Dutch pol politics, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, the moving date for the objects is drawing closer. 7,000 objects will be relocated in the galleries and five kilometers worth of books and 700,000 printed works will be relocated in the depository. In an organization as large as this, clear communication and clear overview are essential. In managing this project, the new Rex Museum Project Bureau uses SharePoint to share information and Microsoft Pivot to create a visual overview of the objects that will soon be on display on the museum. I can't show it live now, but anyone interested to see it live, please come to me and, and we'll demonstrate it to you. Um, this is the, uh, we got all the images, that all the objects that are going to be on display in the new exhibition um, to pull it together into the pivot tool and you can really <laughs> easily browse through it and make selections what's in which room and how do the, uh, um, uh, the on the different uh, I want to see all the paintings in the new building all uh, the ceramics and it turned out to be a very useful tool also for the curators to get a bit of a feeling and a better idea of what we are working for because it, the museum is closed for seven years now we are working on something that's really abstract and this was a handy tool to make it more uh, exciting and more visual and useful and it has several options to organize and browse through and it's connected to the dam system and the collection management system um, and the work being done on the building and the presentation of the collection has increased our interest in the history of the museum. 
We have extensive archives that offer an insight into the Rijksmuseum's past. The archived images in particular present in particular present a unique picture of the building, the staff, and how the collection was managed and displayed. So it's an enormous archive from uh, pictures from over 100 years uh, displaying how, how did this building and the people work with all the objects. And um, we are now at the moment we try to get external funding to, to digitize this material and make it av uh, available to a wide audience. I'll show you some of the pictures um, from the historic photo archive. This is uh, the Night Watch during the war. Um, we um, stored it in a cave yes, <laughs> in the south of the Netherlands. Um, and it came back in the in 45 after the war by boat. And they rolled it up and put it in something, a wooden container. and brought it by boat back to Amsterdam uh, on a ship with, which had the name God Given, so it's very um, poetic. And then it came back and we rolled it out and it's... So here you see Frans van <laughs> Gogh, Rembrandt's famous painting, face down on the carpet in the next <laughs> room. <laughs> we wouldn't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we did in 2003. Um, because we had to, to, to empty, everything had to go out of the building before the reconstruction. <coughs> also the night was, was the last piece and we did lots of press came around and we, it's, um, and many photos of, of this remo the, the, the moving out of the night watch from the, from the main building. And it looks a little bit more professional. <laughs> <laughs> there was a special case made for the, Night watch, and we had to move it across the street because it wasn't possible to do it uh, in any other way. And the whole, uh, all the streets were blocked, and the tram had to drive around. So it was a big thing, and also it was quite complicated <laughs> to get it in there. <laughs> so we, we managed. Um, in 2013, the story continues, and it will be returned to the to the main building, and there will be more new pictures, and new documentation about what we do with this most famous object of the museum. And as you can see in these images, the people, procedures, technology and equipment changes over time. But the objects on, and the building, more or less, will be the same. We are passers by, but we have to be aware that what we generate is significant for future generations. Our working methods, our operations, and the choices that we make at a given moment need to be recorded and archived. In addition, we need to take a critical approach when making decisions regarding, regarding digitization. We can't do it all. We need to avoid being influenced too heavily by new and exciting technology and, um, the, as, as, as Jonathan pointed out, that we feel that we have to do everything. It's, it's okay to have gaps, as you mentioned. It, it has been there always. We can't do it all and we have to keep a clear focus on the people we are doing it for. So. Thank you to all of, um, all of our speakers who are extraordinary today and really informative. I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience. Um, about all of the um, presentations, and so we invite you to just um, start asking questions. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to bring the lights up. This question on when you are posting the images onto the website for for use, are they the high resolution images that people can use for print quality, or we're still discussing it? Okay, but we are the images that are already on the website. They are. Very high resolution, yeah. and you can use it for publication if you want. We have better uh, examples that are more suitable, but it is not exactly the, the number of the resolution that is uh, very high. Mm -hmm. Andy? I have a question for Jonathan. Uh, Deb White said for her installation photograph on the website that uh, they're not worrying about copyright. Did I say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, for, um, for 
like the old ones. Oh, and the catalogs, on the catalogs. Yeah. For the hockey trucks. Okay, sorry, for the catalog. And uh, Jonathan, you said that you're putting all of your special exhibition gallery views yes. on the website. What is your approach towards uh, the, the, the underlying copyright of those objects? Well, you know, certainly because we're uh, just in the early stages of beginning the discussion of putting them online, that hasn't been decided yet. I'm sure that'll, you know, be the topic of a lengthy discussion. Um, the rights issue was a very serious issue when Art Store scanned our images because some of the images, in, um, certainly the museum used a lot of work for hire in producing the images and um, didn't do a good job of securing the rights as I think most institutions were in fact back in the day, decades ago. So certainly not everything that got scanned uh, is available through Artscore because of some of the more, more serious or doubt, questionable rights issues. How that will be renegotiated or rethought about uh, now, three or four years later, is unclear. But as a whole, I mean, these are installation images are generally somewhat easier because we can presume they were produced work for hire, even if the, the, the rights haven't been exactly cleared. That doesn't solve the issue or prevent you or shield you from risk, certainly. But we see in the archives profession that institutions are becoming a little more comfortable treading through the gray area as long as you're willing to take down the challenge um, and as long as you explain these issues uh, appropriately to the public. So I, I don't think that the rights issues are going to detract from the amount of images we're going to be able to make public in any significant way. And let me just add, um, Art Store's collaboration with MoMA on the exhibition and installation archives, it also involved our legal team reviewing every single one of the images before we release them in Art Store. So Art Store, in general, has lawyers review all of the images before we release it in Art Store, just because Art Store Digital Library is a teaching and research database, and so we want to pull down as few images as possible. We don't feel comfortable throwing things up there and then taking them down the following day. So there's a, a, a much more cautious approach. And, and as Jonathan mentioned, made right now is just internally accessible. So we are also actually in the process of reviewing our legal policies and whether the climate has changed in such a way that we can now perhaps release more content where the rights issues are a little more fuzzy. So we're in the process of looking at that too. And again, the community seems to be moving that way, at least uh, the archival community. And it's been very, very reassuring to see it loosen up a little bit. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is for anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, in, in talking about recording, or, uh, archiving all of the, uh, the records for the uh, exhibitions, is there consideration for the design files? So, you know, graphic panel design, floor, you know, gallery layout, any of that kind of thing. I know uh, you talked about um, the, the, the okay. you know, those coming out in an automated way. But what about the rest of the materials? Are those, or are those, has there been an active, active decision to those not can, store them? For the museum, those are considered permanent records. Um, uh, getting them from the design department <laughs> is, um, is complicated because they like, they tend to want to keep their archives um, in the offices to refer to. Um, but we always had a category called um, permanently active but archival records kept okay. in the offices. So we would keep. Um, sort of oversight over them, make sure they didn't get destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as they were being cared for, um, uh, that was all right. Of course, there, there's the huge issue, um, which is an electronic records issue, um, which we didn't touch here, um, of what do you do with CAD records? Because exactly. you know most of the designers are working with CAD these yeah. days. So um, we're going to have to figure out how to how to capture those before they move from you know InDesign. To, the, to whatever the next, the next thing yeah. is. Okay, thank you. It's about the same at MoMA. I mean, certainly I was speaking most directly of curatorial and registrarial records um, at, in terms of special exhibition records, but the archives technically has responsibility for the institutional records from every department. So certainly the direct design records will be there somewhere, whether or not we can at any point make them available to, to the public. 
But certainly a lot of design records filter into the curatorial records anyway because the curators have such a direct role in planning the layout and approving you know, the things that are designed that there's a good amount of stuff within the curatorial records. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is for Deb. Uh, you talked about how the, the final didactic material labels and stuff were now going automatically into collections information. Can you explain the mechanism? Because we've been struggling with that. Um, um, I actually, I can't. Uh, because it, uh, I know it goes into the content management system that our technology department manages. Um, I, and I also, well, I also know that they have a tool that is used and I, um, for the creating the didactics so that um, I don't think they're doing, you know, Microsoft Word to the editor to, you know, and then to the designers. Um, but uh, certainly could find out more about that for you. But, so it's, you know, it's interesting. Different people have different responsibilities for sort of pieces of the pie. I wonder if Jeff could elaborate a little bit on this. Could, could Jeff elaborate a little on the relationship to the Hockey Trust Digital Library? I thought that was very interesting. Oh, um, uh, we reached out to them um, when we realized that they had the digital versions of our books. Um, basically, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, Google Books went out and just digitized huge swaths of the, of the printed world um, from a whole lot of university libraries, um, one of which was the University of Michigan. I think Yale was in there, uh, Oxford. And so um, the people at University of Michigan who are very interested in open access um, decided that they would um, contribute these to a resource so people would at least know what had been scanned and um, could gain access to the full text of things that were no longer in copyright. Um, so when we realized that there was that resource, and I think, I should say, I think that other um, university libraries are starting to contribute to the Hockey Trust, so maybe eventually we'll have all of those Google Book things there um, and or in the Internet Archive. But the, the really wonderful thing about the Hockey Trust project is that they have staff who are going through and analyzing What's, what's been digitized and what is in the public domain. So if they've decided that it's in the public domain, they just put it out there full text. Um, they ran into a little bit of trouble this summer, I guess, because they started, they've started an orphan works project. And if they really couldn't find who owned copyright, they were releasing it. And um, I don't know if they got a cease and desist, but um, certainly they got some press about that. They got good press as well as bad press, obviously. Yes? Uh, were they able to give you copies of the scan catalogs for your own use? Uh, they, they said they would. Um, we, we actually haven't um, gotten them. What we did was uh, we gave them the permissions to release them, and then we pulled the URLs um, using an API into our um, library catalog. So. Um, so they're all accessible. And I know a number of other organizations, Society of American Archivists has released their stuff under Creative Commons. So I would urge all of you who are even thinking about digitizing your catalogs to see if they've got them, because they may well. They had some really obscure, old, little, tiny catalogs. So we don't have to do it. Yes? Um, we've got, at the Art Institute, we've had this ongoing discussion about uh, final version of a catalog should really be a PDF, and that the printed book is a derivative. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, because, you know, the, if you have a digitized version, if you go back and <coughs> scan catalogs that had to be digitized to be printed in right. the first place, doesn't make any sense. Makes sense. And you guys have been scanning your catalogs for, for quite a while, I think. Not really, no. No? I thought the archives was doing catalogs and checklists and putting them on the web. Yeah, check the bar down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> another, another department to department disconnect. Can, you, can any of you talk a little bit about archiving um, audio tours um, and then also thinking about um, kiosks and interactives and exhibitions? 
exhibitions and whether or not you think it's important to just archive the content that's on the kiosk and interactives or um, maintaining some sort of um, emulated environment so you know five years from now, 20 years from now, people are experiencing the kiosk and not just the content. I'll speak only a very little uh, to that and maybe a little disappointingly. <laughs> um, is it not on? Can you go in the back? Hello? I don't know if people in the back can see it. I thought it was on. Right? Yes, it's up. Oh, there we go. Hello? No. <laughs> there we go. Are we going to wait? No. Um, luckily, we don't have that many kiosks to worry about, if any. I mean, and uh, being at MTN for the first time, I certainly haven't previously thought about the situation that History of the Museum, the Science Museum, got out of. Um, Audio tours are an interesting thing, something else that I haven't had to deal with in my job, so that I didn't know about it until I was preparing this talk. We don't know where most of our audio tours are, so, and we've been producing them since 1960. Now, people in the museum might know where they are, but the archive doesn't have them, uh, and we then can't serve them up to people who, who want them. Now, the fact, it, in that sense, this move toward digitization is really useful because the audio, uh, new audio tours are on the web. And we don't expect, say, the architecture of the web or the nature of our website to change to, so that there won't always be a place for them. And I think we can reasonably expect that in terms of audio tours. So it's the older stuff that we're worried about, just like the kind of video produced for the web. Um, I mean, it might be little snippets of low res, but it, it has a place on the web that might be there for quite a while. Meanwhile, the VHS cassettes from the 70s are, for the archive, much more of a present problem because we don't have the money or the money to preserve those. Uh, you know, with kiosks or with apps, it's something that I'm, I've been thinking about lately is a lot of our apps are just repackaging content, you know, tour information, public hours, ticketing, things like that. So it, it's unclear if the content is really important to preserve in that package. Although certainly in 50 years, if someone wants a full picture of what the museum is doing, then they might. But just like a still photo doesn't capture an exhibition uh, to the extent, then there's going to be ways that we can capture it that are going to be you know, what we can do, even as insufficient as they are. And I think it's, it's good to be back. I can add something to that uh, from Mama, um, which is that right now we're in the process, this is another one of those disconnects. Yeah. Uh, we're in the process of serving the entire museum to identify those audio tours and also curatorial interviews and anything, any any sorts of media that are related to the exhibitions uh, with the long-term goal of, well, medium-term goal of doing a proposal for next fiscal year to uh, expand our dam capability and then bring that material into the dam that you then might, because a lot of this, a lot of the same material that's accessible to made is also accessible to the dam, and probably similar to the way made is working, you can enter an exhibition number, pull up, not just the still images, but also the other video. But Eric, your survey uh, is not including pre-digital materials, is it? Not yet, yeah. but it's identifying. It's identifying okay, those materials, but that survey, that proposal won't include a uh, proposal to digitize analog right. materials. Right. Yeah. In, uh, in Amsterdam, in the 19th we also didn't, we don't have a beautiful archive with our audio and video material. But we discovered a box full of tapes uh, not so long ago. Um, uh, what we did is that we we had a look at it. We talked about it. Should, should we, are we the, the best in uh, keeping this for the future? Or should we go and look out there uh, to see if someone else can store it for us? And uh, in the Netherlands, we have a big project running. Uh, it's built and geluid, and they are also turning around. They are presenting at many conferences. And they, um, it's a big storing project for uh, video and audio <coughs> material, historical material. So we collected the material, we made descriptions, uh, indexes, and we uh, gave it to them to digitize in the best possible way for the future. So we. And we try to do that more. That, that we don't think we can do it all, and we are trying to look for the people 
uh, who made it their specialty in, in storing it for us. And we can use it uh, on the web. And um, a couple of thoughts about audio tours. One of the things we faced in archives was the copyright issue. Um, and looking back at the contracts with the companies that made the audio tour. And um, the copyright was not ours in many of the cases. And that is a major problem. Um, so working that out, figuring that out before you before you can serve them up on the web is, is an issue. Um, and um, the collaboration uh, that Herak has just mentioned, we also um, sort of accidentally um, collaborated. Uh, we had a very early audio tour called Listening to Pictures, where we interviewed artists talking about their works in the collection in 1967. And before we ever had an archive, the real-to-real -real tapes were given to the Archives of American Art. And I came in, you know, as the first archivist, and I said, ah, how could you ever give those away? We had the transcriptions, but not the tapes. But providentially, they've been doing amazing things with digitization, and they actually digitized all of those tapes, and they gave us back a set of the MC. So um, we're getting ready to put those into our dam. Um, there are certainly some copyright issues about releasing them. We do have releases from most of the artists, but some of them didn't send back the release letter. So um, I'm hoping that at some point those can go out. But I think, um, Eric, um, the, the approach of surveying them as part of electronic records management or part of a, you know, a survey of audiovisual stuff and getting them into the dam is definitely, in my mind, the first step for the, form, for the stuff that's already there. I just had a question for the panel also, which is, um, and I think here too, when you mentioned just budget and resources and figuring out, you know, who are we archiving this material for and what are the target audiences? Um, what have, I mean, the panelists, but also in the audience, what have your museums determined to be sort of the primary mission of archiving certain materials? You know, why the press releases, why the catalogs, et cetera? Um, and how have you made those decisions? Well, I think that um, in, in the archives, and, and I think Deb had a talk about this a month or two ago, we have what we call the workforce collections. These are the collections that people use all the time, but they ask for them, they ask after them, they come to us for them. Press releases are number one. Um, installation photos, very high up on the list. Um, these are, in terms of archival documentation, these are very dense with information uh, uh, as compared to, say, a, a, a folder of 100 pieces of paper from a territorial department, which might be very valuable, but is much less dense. Um, you know, so those are the reasons we focus, we have focused on those things um, in, in terms of, of uh, aligning our resources. You know, our, our exhibition of paper files uh, certainly, we spent so much time because those are almost equally as important. I mean, certainly in terms of uh, to researchers and to serious academics, they're very, very important. Whereas uh, press releases and, and installation photos have a broader uh, range of, of users, I, I would suspect. So it, it, it becomes very easy to um, to uh, to make those decisions as far as that goes. It's harder to come up with the money then to, to actually get the project. Um, I can talk a little bit about return on investment because I, there was a part of my talk that actually got cut. So um, we had a, a very important show in 1923 called Primitive Negro Art, chiefly from the Belgian Congo. It was the first time that African objects were shown as art in a museum. Um, it was always an exhibition that had heavy research use um, from serious scholars, people who wanted to come and look at everything. And it happened that the documentation of this show was scattered throughout um, like about 80 chronological um, folders of curatorial records. So anytime anybody came to look at what we call PNA, um, you had to pull out, you know, multiple boxes, multiple folders, and then they would have to go through the folder to look for the one or two letters that were in that folder. Now, our finding aid was good enough that we could say what folders, but 
you know, it still was very labor intensive. Um, as part of our Mellon grant, we said, okay, let's create a virtual exhibition file and digitize these specific materials for this exhibition and put them up on the website. So we did the correspondence, we did the you know dozen or so installation views, and we actually did all of the um, the publications, the catalog, the, the checklist, and so forth. Um, for this, I was looking at some stats for the when I was preparing for this talk, and I said, you know, how many hits do we get on our exhibition pages? How long do they stay? And I looked at this area, which is segregated in the archives area. You have to know that it's a digital collection, and you have to know to go there. And, you know, there are not very many hits, you know, under 100 hits um, for the collection over a year. People did stay. It was fairly sticky once they got there. So, you know, if you looked at the separate documents, people might be on there for two minutes looking at, you know, at a particular screen. So I think it's serving the research purpose, but it was very expensive to do. I don't think we would do that again unless there was a grant that specifically want, you know, wanted us to do that because they wanted to get these materials out. So, um, and, and, and we are at the moment making those decisions. Should we anchor <coughs> this? Uh, should we do, should we do uh, uh, digitize and uh, publish? all exhibition material. And um, in the new Rijks Museum, there will be an uh, information center, the library and the documentation will be together and made public for the first time. Because lots of the curatorial files and, and as I said, the historic photo collection, it's, I think almost no one knows it's there. So it's quite an exciting time, but we are now at the moment finding everything bringing it together, structuring it, because it's, it's, quite, it's quite messy. But I think we'll, we'll manage, and then, and then we are going to look what's going to be of great value for digitization. And then the public and the people who will benefit from it will always be uh, a main uh, focus point in making the decisions. Thank you. Well, um, if there are no more questions, are there any other questions? But, but well, thank you all so much for joining us for this.